Good morning, church family. As you can see, the Britons are on vacation, but we, oh, hold on. Woo. Okay, there we go. The Britons are on vacation, but we are honored this morning to have Warren bring God's word. So Warren, I would encourage you this morning, share what God has put on your heart, church family. Uh, it is good for us to gather today. For those who are worshiping on the green, we're glad you guys are out there. Hopefully you've got your umbrellas and the beverage and your communion elements. For those in the cars, thanks for joining us. And for those online, we're glad you guys came and checked out Church Online this morning. Community, it's time for us to worship together. Warren, bring the word. Yeah, thank you very much, Pastor Kevin. It is uh, wonderful to be here today and not be able to see you and awkwardly stand to a camera. So I apologize if, if I'm not directly focusing on you, it's because I don't know what I'm doing. So anyway, it's great to be here. Uh, I don't know whether to be honored to be bringing a message on such a high pressure day or to be suspicious of Pastor Kevin, uh, since there's still a week left for people to write in grievances for eldership. Um, I do want to say that all views expressed here today uh, have been agreed to upon by Brian Waterbury as well. So if you have a grievance, you can share that with him too as well. So anyway, I know you're thinking, man, that is a wonderful shirt you're wearing today. And I will say that uh, I'm wearing it in honor of my beautiful girls. Uh, and also, I'm wearing it in honor of my dad. Uh, see, he does not refer to this color as pink, rather as angry salmon. So uh, from here on forward, all men, it's okay to wear, wear pink as long as you call it angry salmon. Uh, Pastor Tim this week uh, came to me and said, hey, uh, can you please give me a title to your message? And I kind of struggled with that uh, until this morning I told him, hey, I don't need the TV. I, in fact, I don't even know the title. So I just came up with the title not too long ago, and it's basically Father's Day message. So hopefully that is uh, direct, and uh, you'll understand who I'm speaking to and the target audience is. I love men and, 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 and speaking into men's lives, and I feel that's something that God has called me to do. To do. So today, I want to speak to you fathers directly. I hope that it's both instructional, I hope it's convicting, and I hope that we can uh, use it practically in our lives. So uh, let's pray this morning. Father God, I come to you and I thank you so much for the opportunity to open up your word and uh, to seek your face on Father's Day. Lord. Give us insight into the Father's heart. Lord, please give us opportunity to be the fathers that you have designed us to be for our children. And this we pray in Jesus' name. When you mention the word father, dad, daddy, uh, it may conjure up thoughts in your mind. It may conjure up uh, specific words or experiences or emotions. And... and Today, while that may happen, I, I do want to speak directly to three points of what a father's role is in his family, and that is provider, protector, and promoter. When I was three years old, I can remember it vividly, and, and it's, it's one of those memories that stick out, and it stuck out for the, my whole life. My mom and dad at that time had had another argument, and I can, remember the, I can even remember the room that was happening in and, and I see my mother in the background and, and my dad comes down to me and uh, he's got his three-year-old son that he's looking at and his one-year-old baby boy in the other room and he looks at his three-year-old son and tells him, listen, daddy's going to leave. Daddy's going to be gone for a while. But I'll be back on the weekend and we'll, we'll go do something fun. Well, I didn't realize that in that moment that generations would be affected from then on. See, mom and dad got a divorce, and he left. And uh, a scary place to be for both mom and dad as the future was unknown. But for the kids that were left, what was going to happen? See, when a father is absent from the home, we can experience his covering removed in the areas that I previously had mentioned, in provision, protection, and promotion. The U.S. Census Bureau stats say that uh, we really do have a father issue in our nation where 20 million children go to bed every night without their dad at home. That's one in four kids. When this happens, those kids are four times greater risk of poverty. They're more likely to have behavioral problems. They're two times greater risk of infant mortality. They're more likely to go to prison, more likely to commit a crime. They're seven times more likely to become pregnant as a teen. 
They're more likely to face abuse and neglect. They're more likely to abuse drugs and alcohol. They're two times more likely to suffer obesity and two times more likely to drop out of high school. And the stats go on. The stats go on. While we know the effects of absent fatherhood is, and, and, and we can see it in our society today, I do want to speak directly to another type, and that's absentee fatherhood. See, that's the dad that's home, but not present. That's the dad that's home and doesn't engage with their kids. That's the dad that's home that doesn't connect with his children, calling them into adulthood. That's the dad who goes to work, is stuck in a cycle of life, comes home, turns on the TV, and neglects his responsibility of fathering his children. Now, I know that this hits home for some of us, as it does me, but I do want to speak to that some more. And uh, when you go to the Scriptures in 1 Kings chapter 1, uh, I'm going to paraphrase this chapter because there's a lot to it, but we are here at the end of King David's life. He's about 70 years old, and he's dying. And... Uh, King David had fathered about a dozen children with different wives. And if you read about David as king, we, we see many, many great things that he accomplished. But when you read about David as father, there are a lot of issues. In fact, it speaks to how absent he was as a father, how he didn't, how he didn't discipline his kids when they didn't, did wrong, when he didn't instruct them and bring them up. Um, and we know that through a lot of these actions and the sins that David committed in his life, that his family felt the consequences. There was continual rebellion in his home and, and strife and conflict all the days of his life until he died. And so in 1 Kings chapter 1, Adonijah, his fourthborn, but his oldest, since the other three sons are, are, are deceased, his fourthborn son, Adonijah, he realizes that his father is dying. And uh, while not having that relationship, he... he he knows at the back of his mind that Solomon is the one that's to come to the throne, but there's an opportunity here for him where that he can come in, provide for himself, protect for himself, promote himself to kingship before Solomon can be. So what he does is he, is he, uh, is, is, is he rounds up Joab, a man of war, the, king, uh, the uh, commander of David's army, Abiathar, the priest, and then a lot of officials, and, and his other brothers and king folk and family, and they bring in and they come and have a ceremony and they sacrifice to the Lord saying that, that Adonijah is a rightful king of Israel. While this was going on, this rebellion was going on, uh, Nathan the prophet went to Bathsheba who birthed Solomon, who was promised kingship by David himself, and who is the only son that we can read in Scripture that has any kind of relationship with his father David. And at this time, Nathan tells Bathsheba, this is what's going on. If you don't act now, you will be killed. You weren't invited. Adonijah will come after you. So they concoct a plan where, where they go in. Bathsheba goes in and explains to David the situation, and then Nathan comes in after him. Well, during this time, David understands the weight of what's going on and and how future generations will be affected, and that Solomon is a rightful king, that, Ad, that Ad, Adonijah is not. He is not in relationship with his father. Solomon is a rightful king. And at this time, we see this, this relationship between a father and son in its, in its, in its, uh, in its effect of uh, protection, provision, and promotion. And David, what does he do? He protects his son by bringing his mighty men to protect him, provides for him son by giving him the resources, including his, his donkey to ride on, and then he promotes his son to king. When this happens, they, they go through the streets of Jerusalem there, and Solomon is proclaimed as king. Now, of course, Adonijah and all, all the people that are congregated, they see this and they, and they flee, because they see, that, see that, uh, that their lives are in danger. But what's interesting here is that we see the effects of what happens when a father is there, but he's absent. See, Adonijah took it into his own hands to provide, protect, and promote himself, while Solomon did not have to do that. His dad did that for him. His dad did that for him and exalted him to kingship. See, when we are not 
disconnected to our kids, when we are not engaged, the probability of rebellion gets exponentially uh, greater. And unfortunately, uh, when, you, when you see this, when you remove the father or diminish the father's role in, soci in society or even within his own family, then typically the result is rebellion. We see this today in our own nation. We even may see this in our own homes. Where the father is absent, there is rebellion. We need fathers to step up in these roles, in their roles of provider, protector, and promoter, to call up their sons, of daughters, sons and daughters into adulthood to be the man and woman of God that he has called them to be. I want to ask you gentlemen the question today. Are you inviting your kids into adulthood? Am I involved and am I connected? A great example of this is in Matthew chapter 4, if you turn there, and again I'm going to paraphrase this too because it's, it's a, a, quite a long scripture. But here in chapter 4 we read about Jesus' temptation and we really get a glimpse into the relationship that he has with his heavenly father. See, when he's out there, what happens? Satan comes to him and says, Hey, turn this, turn this rock into bread. Provide. I'm going to provide for you. Jesus responds, No. He takes him to the pinnacle of the temple and says, If you jump, you'll be caught. What is Jesus' response? No. Finally, Satan tries to promote him and says, Bow down to me and I will give all of this to you. What is Jesus' response there? Be gone, Satan. And he refers to the first commandment in Exodus chapter 20, where I'd like you to turn. Jesus says, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Satan wants to provide, wants to protect, wants to promote you. Do not listen. I urge you, as fathers, to step into the role that you are called to be, because if you don't, he will. In, that, in Exodus chapter 20, the reason Jesus refers to this is because he understands the implication of the decisions that he is making. He knows that by following his heavenly Father, by declaring that he is Lord of his life, that he is his Father and in relationship with him, that future generations will be able to be in relationship with him because he is obedient. In Exodus chapter 20 verse 4 it says, You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them for I the Lord your God am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. Turn to Deuteronomy 7, verse 9, and there it reads, Know therefore that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love Him and keep His commandments to a thousand generations. To how many generations? To a thousand generations. You follow the Lord's commandments. He is with your family. His promise is there for a thousand generations. Incredible. Psalm 103, verse 17. But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear Him and His righteousness to children's children, to those who keep His covenant and remember to do His commandments. Listen, dads. Your decisions today, whether you choose to follow God or whether you don't, has an effect for generations to come. That's what's going to happen. So you choose life, you choose death. That's what's going to happen to your family. That's what's going to follow it. Until someone steps up and says enough is enough. That someone was my dad. Yes, they got a divorce. Yes, he left. He could have left. He had the opportunity to leave the country. 
the opportunity to advance himself elsewhere. But he decided to stay. It must be the shirt. Oof. My dad at that time in his life was running the most successful nightclub and restaurant in the country. He was doing really well, doing excellent. But his life was empty because he was following over things that, that cannot fill that void that all of you men feel that chase after the next greatest thing, whether it be in relationships or stuff. He left this nightclub one night and, and uh, was having this conversation with himself that, Lord, if you are truly there, come and meet me right now. And you know what? The Lord met him right then and there on the pavement outside of that nightclub. He made the decision that day that he would turn from that life, that he would live his life as Christ would have him live and give his life to Jesus. And I tell you what, that decision on that night, after leaving that nightclub, changed the course of his entire family. Since then, he's had four boys, all of which follow the Lord. Two of those boys have had four other children, all of which follow the Lord. He broke the cycle. He said, enough is enough. I want you to turn to Joshua chapter 24, verse 15. This is not some pithy exclamation that we put up on a wall, some cute up, up on the wall, some cute scripture. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I think we pass over that so much. I want to speak directly to that today. Because every man has a Joshua 24 experience, whether you like it or not. Every man does out there. The context of Joshua 24. Joshua's coming to the end of his life, just like David was. 110 years old, done pretty good. Served Israel, served God really well. But he knew that at this moment that the nation and his family had a decision to make. They had a decision whether to follow the gods across the Euphrates, the gods of their heritage, the gods across the Red Sea, the gods of their upbringing, or the gods that were there after they crossed the Jordan, the gods of the Amorites. He knew that Israel had to make the decision and had to continue to make this decision of who to follow. Are you going to follow the gods of your heritage? Hey, where I came from? My, my, fam my family's not good enough. I've got X, Y, Z happening. The gods of my upbringing... Things happened in my life that were hard and affected me the rest of my life, so I'm going to use that as an excuse not to change and, 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 and turn to Jesus. Or the gods of our culture, complacency, absenteeism, not being there. Who are you going to serve? Joshua says, in front of the entire nation, as for me, and my household, my family, as for, as for us, my, my group, my people, we will serve the Lord. See, that's what my dad did that night. He fell to his knees and he said, Lord, I declare today that I will serve you. I don't know what that's going to look like. That's scary, but I will serve you. Because of that, generations are affected. The Danish philosopher and theologian Soren Kierkegaard, he put it this way, Life must be lived looking ahead, but it can only be understood looking back. See, Joshua understood this. Look, all of us have stuff, guys. I mean, all you men. We can have a conversation just like we are today. And you can come up with all these excuses of why you're not a good father, why you can't be a good father, why you can't do this, why you can't do that. And yet, we still all have the opportunity to make the decision whether to follow Jesus or not comes down to that. God is calling us dads. He's calling you, dad, to a place of commitment, to a place of declaration. Who will you serve? What a wonderful Father's Day gift, guys. Will you realize this morning that you can become the father that you need to be for your children. You can be the provider, the protector, and the promoter, even if you're not living in the home. My dad wasn't living in the home. 
and yet he was present. That's crazy. That's the power that Jesus has. So today, I wanted to challenge all of us dads to make this declaration, whether it be, uh, you know, here in silence or um, later on. But I do want to ask you guys, who are you following? Who are you following? Who are your kids following? Who will your kids follow? Who will your kids' kids follow? Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. If we confess this with our mouths, believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, then you will be saved. The best Father's Day gift anybody can ever receive. He will change your life and change the trajectory of future generations because one man stood up and said, enough is enough. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So this morning, we're going to pray, and I want you fathers to follow me in this prayer and believe in your heart. And if you need to, conf- you need to confess it, find someone to confess that to today. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning and uh, acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord. We want to commit our lives to you so that our children and their children's children can serve and follow you. Father, this morning, I'm not sure if I know you, but I want to make it known today that I do. I believe that Jesus Christ died on that cross for me. And through him and only through him can I be in relationship with my heavenly Father. And because of you, Jesus, you allow me to be the Father that I need to be for my children. So today, Lord, I ask that you give me the strength to serve you all the days of my life.